Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's uh, July 7th, 2013. Um, this video is going to be <clears throat> maybe a little more controversial than some of them. Uh, I guess I've done a couple of out there videos before, so maybe it's not that different. But this one hits at uh, maybe a couple of the passages in the Bible where there's stronger opinions about what is the right interpretation versus the wrong interpretation. And I'm actually not going to, uh, you know, at the beginning of my whole YouTube channel, I, I said we look through a glass dimly and, you know, take what I'm saying just as another informed opinion. And I'm A-OK -okay being wrong on any of these videos you've watched, by the way. Um, I just, you know, like everybody, if you get passionate about something, you state something in a very determined way, uh, you know, sometimes it draws people's ire. I know that happens a lot with the uh, different views of the rapture of the church. And um, I try to be careful around that when I like to present uh, the way I think about it, the pre-tribulation a premillennial uh, rapture of the church and second coming in that order. And um, that's the way I think it makes sense out of the Bible. And I think every time I step into one of these trickier ones, uh, I try to provide Bible passages and backup material just to say I didn't get hooked on a concept and can't defend it from the Bible. I know people that pick other views of things um, need to go through and do their Bible studies too. And that's the way these things should be uh, brought forward, I think, is that you, you, know, you bring your point of view, but then you defend it by the whole context of the Bible. And I think the trouble always comes, at least when I think about like the pre-tribulation rapture versus the mid-tribulation or, or post-tribulation rapture, you defend it with the context of the whole Bible, not picking out one or two passages. Um, and that's the best way to do things. So this video, I'm going to try and pitch a, a wider context. And then down below in the, um, you know, in the notes section for this video, I'm going to include a whole slew of links. And the reason why I got onto this topic and what got me going today was uh, I did a Bible study, um, Dr. Andy Wood or Woods from uh, Sugarland Bible Chapel. He's he writes these great articles. I don't know if anybody's run into him before, but uh, they they post on I think it's Prophecy Blog as well as his uh, church's home website, and I've seen him copying into other places as well. But um, he he does a real rigorous job of going through some of these, uh, you know, if you want to say church doctrines and defends them scripturally as well as he goes into the, you know, the, some of the famous uh, Bible theologians in the past and he gathers up a point of view and summarizes really well. So you'll get a taste of it if you haven't read any of his articles. I'm going to link <laughs> It's, it's, uh, he's currently up to uh, installment number 17 on this whole issue of the kingdom of God. And um, it's brilliant, I think, because there's so much debate, especially when we get into Matthew 24, um, as to what we're looking at when we look at the end of the age and, and the um, tribulation period. And so... That will be some context as well as my comments, but um, I'll do that. I think I'll actually link to one or two other interpretations of Matthew 24 just to kind of defend this point. But I know what I'm going to say runs counter to a lot of teaching. And so I'm just going to put it out there and, you know, throw it in there with the mix of the other opinions you got. But I, I think this is the correct way of interpreting from the Bible, even though I know and I can see other ways of, of interpreting these passages. Okay, so I danced around that enough, and hopefully then nobody sends me nasty grams. 
uh, on the bottom of this video. So the broad point that I'm going to state is that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, was pitched toward uh, the Jewish people, and the point was that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. And I think if people have done other Bible studies, you know that each of the four Gospels has a different intended target and has a different, uh, you know, language and approach that it uses for the intended target. I think Luke was, you know, pitched to the Greek or the Gentile and, and whatever. I don't want to get into that. Actually, I'll get off course. But since Matthew was pitched at the Jewish person, you have to take a look at this in terms of, you know, first century Judaism and what they're expecting in terms of the Messiah. And the other real interesting thing is um, realize that, you know, the Gospels are prior to the giving of the Holy Spirit um, in the church age. Now, Jesus did say, you know, on this rock, I will build my church. He announced that he's going to build his church. So the idea of the church being built was presented in the Gospel, but you know, the, whenever a um, Bible was given, it had to make sense to the, or whenever uh, the, yeah, the, the Bible passages were given, it had to make sense to the person at the time they heard it. And so, uh, you know, these things that Jesus was saying was prior to the Gospels being written later, and he was saying it before the church age, right? And so, that's the context that they've got is that in Matthew, he's talking to uh, his disciples, the apostles. He's explaining to them um, things in the context of the Old Testament fulfillment of who the Messiah was going to be. And he hadn't, he, there, you know, there wasn't a Paul epistles yet talking about the church and the meaning of the church. And so that's the context we're setting up on this thing. Now, the next thing, and this is blown out into the, you know, 17 uh, articles down below from Dr. Wood, is um, the kingdom of God and the expectation from the Old Testament was that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to set up his government and rule the whole earth and you know you get all those old testament passages about the child will put his hand in the viper's den and not get bit and the lamb will feed with the lion and and you know the the whole messianic kingdom was being described in the old testament and the apostles had this expectation that jesus was going to set up his kingdom and that the Roman Empire was going to get put down and they were going to move into that millennial kingdom. And that was the genuine offer Jesus was giving them. And it wasn't until uh, that offer was rejected, um, sending him to the cross, that, that basically the, you know, the pause button, if you want to say, was pushed on the kingdom program. And from an Old Testament perspective, that's where we see in Daniel 9 verses 24 through 27 we see this break in the 490 year um, program that was supposed to bring in the uh, the uh, millennial reign uh, you see this break <laughs> right with the you know the last week that was left the last seven years that was left it's in the text you can see it and uh, what happens right before the seven years at the end was the Messiah gets cut off. And so, you know, we see this whole program is outlined at Daniel 70 weeks. That, um, so let's move forward. And what I'm doing is I'm starting here and I'm in Bible Gateway, King James Version. And everybody, I think, knows that the, the chapter breaks um, and the verse numbers were added, you know, several hundred years after 
even a couple hundred years after the canonization of the Bible. And so sometimes it's helpful to back up a little bit before you roll forward. So in this case, although I'm looking at some, some of the verses in Matthew 24 and 25, we're going to back up here and take a look at Matthew 23 and how it finishes off, and then we'll move forward with some comments. So um, here in Matthew 23, Right at the very end of 23, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so um, one of the points that's going to be made in the articles I linked below was this was basically Jesus' send-off to the Jewish people. Um, you know, your house is left to you desolate. Okay. And you will not see me again until they say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, which that's a reference to Psalm 118. That's, uh, you know, what they're going to uh, cry out when they're in the wilderness during the tribulation that brings the second coming of the Lord, just as he promised here. So the context of this whole thing is to the Jewish people, and he's telling them, you're not going to see me, Jewish people, until the second coming because you're going to call for me, okay? So there's there's no church context in this. and So let's just roll forward then. And in Matthew 24 now, I went down to verse 3. Um, the And he sat upon the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came to him and said privately, Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of that coming and the end of the world? And in other translations, uh, it says the end of the age. But um, again, from a Jewish context, they don't know about this 2,000-year break of the church age. They're expecting Jesus to set up his uh, millennial reign put down the Romans and they're trying to figure out when's this going to happen <laughs> and when is you know when's that going to come to pass because he also talked about dying and having to go to the cross and so you know he's telling him here that um, when's the end of the world or the end of the age well the end of the age that they're in the age that they're in is the times of the Gentiles and the age began with Nebuchadnezzar taking over uh, the Jewish temple and, and the first Jewish temple and you know decimating it in 586 BC that was the start of the reign the time of the Gentiles and as we see in Daniel 2 the image of the statue it doesn't end until the second coming of Christ and that all all that Daniel passage is again pitched to the Jewish people and so what they're really saying is tell us when shall these things be and he was describing uh, the destruction of the temple and all this uh, that was going to come upon them and he Jesus answered now by saying you know uh, he's going to talk about the end of the age as they would understand it which is when he's going to come back and set up his reign over the world, okay? So the end of the Gentile age is what they're asking, the second coming. Whew. So now what I'm going to do is um, step into something controversial. I'm going to bring up just a little chart, and I know I don't make great charts. I apologize for that. <laughs> what I did... And I was going to do more, but then I sort of ran out of room, so I stopped. But this is Matthew 24 down here, and this is Revelation 6 here. And then I just made one reference to verses in Joel here. So let's just kind of go back and forth, because what I want to do is show that starting almost immediately in Matthew 24, with Jesus' answer, he's starting with the seals being open basically um, so he's starting in 
the tribulation period. He's, he's answering the question by talking about the tribulation period. Nothing to do with the church, the rapture of the church, the lead up to the end of the church age. None of that. He's, he's basically picking right up after you say the rapture of the church happens. We release the pause button. And now where are we? We're in the tribulation period. And that's exactly where Jesus starts with the uh, Matthew 24. And in verse 5, he talks about false Christs. In verse 6, he talks about wars and rumors of wars. In verse 7, he talks about famines and earthquakes and pestilence. Then in verse 9 through 10, he's warning them that they're going to deliver up and, and kill you. And then if you skip forward from there, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee because great tribulation is is going to come upon you and um, let's just then compare that with with revelation in revelation 6 we know the very first seal that's busted we see the image of a rider on a white horse with a bow and no arrows coming to conquer and conquer uh, i forget how that's pronounced or how it's worded but um he is the false Christ. He is the Antichrist. And so again, Jesus' very first answer to their question was pointing to the first seal. And then this, the second you know, thing that Jesus stated was about wars and rumors of wars. And the very second seal opened in Revelation 6 is the red horse and wars uh, go out across the world. And then the next thing that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24 is famines, earthquakes, and pestilence. And in the third seal uh, in Revelation, you've got the black horse, which is famine. Um, and then uh, the next thing that happens in verses 9 through 10 of Matthew 24 is he's talking about they'll be delivered up and they'll be killed. And the next thing that happens in Revelation uh the the uh, fourth horse is um, death, and so these things line up, and then you get a little bit more um, <clears throat> lining up that comes later. And we get to get through Matthew 24. <clears throat> sorry, skips down, uh, and when you see the abomination and desolation, flee because great tribulation is coming. Well, in, in Revelation, we get more detail. We get, you know, the fifth and sixth seal. We get the sun goes black and the moon turns red. But we do get this reference at the midpoint of the tribulation in Revelation. Um, it talks about how the serpent's going to come after. Uh, basically, it's imagery. Right? It's going to come after, you know, the Jewish people and... Um, God will give the Jewish people the wings of an eagle to flee into the hills is basically what's being talked about. And so um, there's there's definitely some paralleling still going on. So the broad point's going to be Matthew 24, starting right away in verse 5, answering to the disciples asking about his coming and the end of the age. It's It's a Jewish context. And his answer starts at the beginning of the opening of the seals in Revelation. So why is that so controversial? Well, the controversial stuff comes in Matthew 25. But uh, let's just finish off. I'll make one other little parallelism here. Um, I'm not sure if, if I'm going to put a lot of weight on this one, but I just noticed as I was going through uh, Revelation and uh, chapter 8 verse 12 sun and moon get darkened and then in uh, chapter 9 verses 1 through 11 there's this pretty long discussion of uh, a locust demonic <clears throat> uh, stinging locust coming out of the pit and in Joel uh, 2 verses 1 through 11 we happen to have a locust and a sun and moon reference um, marching over the face of the earth uh, so it, you can this is i guess i was just suggesting if you want to try and figure out where on the timeline that these things go 
it's good to try and create charts and line them up because you will see linkages and it will point you to where you are in these different prophetic passages. And so that's kind of why I do these grids every now and then. So um, that's the point. Now let's skip back. And uh, in Matthew 24, we're going to just read a bunch of verses here. For as lightning came out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And so I'm picking up in this verse because this is Jesus' response, and he's talking about his return, the coming of the Son of Man. And remember, the Jewish people won't see him again until the second coming. The context wasn't rapture. The context was second coming, the coming of the Son of Man, you know, to earth. Um, and then you can, it's reinforced by the fact that right away he's talking about where the carcasses are. There's the eagles we've gathered. Well, what's the very first thing he does when he comes to earth is he basically puts down in the Armageddon campaign, he puts down all these enemies that were coming after him. Um, immediately after the tribulation in those days. Okay. Um, let's see if there's any other interesting things here. Um, yeah, and then shall appear a sign in the heaven, son of man in heaven, a sign of the son of man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And here's the interesting uh, verse and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other um, and then he goes into the parable of the fig tree now um, you could say well that this is the saints this is us the church coming with Jesus down to earth but I actually think in context of again the the Jewish people didn't understand that it was this concept of the church age and the saints and all, all that hadn't been spelled out to them then. And so the elect has got to be, uh, he's going to gather the elect of the Jewish people um, from the earth. And that does actually have parallel and presence in the Old Testament and the timeline charts we did of the video series. Um, we talked about how in Ezekiel 20, the Jewish people are gathered into the wilderness and just like there's a sheep and goat judgment for the Gentile nations, the very first thing that happens on that timeline was actually what I believe this is referring to is all the Jewish people from the earth are gathered into the wilderness and then they need to pass under the rod and in, in the same way uh, he's separating the sheep as they come out of the sheepfold by passing under the rod. And so only believing Jewish remnant will will make it into the Messianic kingdom. And I think that's really what's going on here. Again, Jewish context, learn the parable of the fig tree. Fig tree is a symbol for uh, faithful Israel. When the branch is yet tender and puts forth its leaves, you know, the summer is near. Likewise, when you see all these things, know that is near even at the doors. Verily I say to you, all this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And if you then take a look at, you know, what, what are all these things, you know, kind of the antecedent or what, what's being referred to, well, we just got done with the discussion of, of basically um, all those passages that we lined up saying that we were in the period of the tribulation, right? So the the parable of the fig tree is saying when all these things, uh, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And so uh, we'll see, you know, basically the, um, the Jewish people putting forth their branches and almost everybody sees that as 1948 when the Jewish people nation was declared and that's when the branches went forward. And then uh, all these things need to occur and will happen in terms of the tribulation. And then the Son of Man will return and the generation will still be there. And so that's why we know basically that we're, we're really close right now. If we're this close to the tribulation, that, that generation of Jewish people 
will see all the way through the tribulation and some will see the return of Christ, we know then that the church, which needs to leave before this, must be really close to leaving right now. So that's that. Um, and now the sticky part, because um, here's, here's all these passages that are used and applied kind of to the church. But of that day and hour, uh, knoweth no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah, so shall, be, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came so and took them all away. And then you get these things, then you get these passages that potentially people use to defend the rapture right in here. Two shall be in a field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. And so how do we reconcile this? Well, I'm just going to propose because I do, uh, <laughs> I'm very sympathetic to the point of not being completely convinced myself, but I'm very sympathetic to the idea of that sure seems like a rapture passage when, you know, these ones are taken, the other are left. But I'll just put out there that if this whole, if this whole gospel and this whole set of passages was pointed toward the Jewish people, they were unaware of the church age, you sure wouldn't be getting a church reference to the rapture down here. And I think I'll go find in like an article from uh, Jack Kelly. I know he defends this pretty well saying what's really being referenced here is, is who's going to qualify to come into the millennial reign. Uh, that's uh, the notion of taken in and left has to do with coming into the millennial kingdom. Uh, and uh, it's, I guess it's furthered by looking at, you know, some of these outlines here of, now this is just the broad outline. And I use New King James Version because we pick up some of these, you know, headers to some of these passages. So in 24, again, Jesus responding to what are the signs of the time and the end of the age in New King James Version, which, again, in a Jewish context, end of the age is the end of the times of the Gentiles. It's the end of the 70th week of Daniel. That's what Jesus was responding to. And he starts, and again, this one picks it up the same way I just talked about it. It, it picks up with the signs of um, the uh, tribulation period. Okay. Um, and then we talked about this, how gathering of his elect from one he end of heaven to the other in a Jewish context may just be gathering them together into the wilderness for their judgment before they go into the millennium. Okay. And then the no one knows the day or the hour has to be in, to the return of Christ and the second coming. And you can defend that a little bit down here. Therefore, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so right at the beginning of, um, let's go all the way back here, um, the coming of the Lord and um, in 2339 uh, is what they're looking for. Let me see if there's a better passage here. And what shall be the sign of that coming in the end of the world? So all these references in 24 and in 25, uh, and even here where we start to get into these passages that people defend for the church, the references, the coming of the Son of Man in the Jewish context is the second coming. And so that's very likely what is being pointed to here. So uh, that's, you know, <laughs> a bit of controversy because these passages are used as rapture verses. And I don't think any of this, uh, if you know. Okay, shifting gears here right at the end of this video. I just wanted to address one thing, which is just about everybody uh, today that is watching or is, calls themselves a watcher. Um, makes frequent reference to 
earthquakes and the spread of disease and famines and strange things going on in, <clears throat> in the waters um, and in the sky. We've got the meteors and coronal mass ejections in the sun and all sorts of stuff. And uh, you might say, well, you know, go to your chart, all this stuff in Matthew 24 started, you know, in the tribulation period. And this is where, you know, I'm not trying to draw real rigid lines because there's this um, verse, um, I'm back in Matthew 24, sorry. And in verse 8, it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And, uh, you know, it was referencing here, you know, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places. And the beginning of sorrows, <clears throat> this is sorrows is a translation for, you know, the birth pangs. And so let's just take a look at Luke also. Luke 21, uh, starting in verse 8, it said, Take heed that you not be deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and therefore time draweth near. Uh, go ye not therefore after them, but when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilence, fearful sights, great signs in heaven, <clears throat> great signs shall uh, there be from heaven. And then uh, there's a quick transition, but before all these things, and then they, they actually go into a whole set of passages that talk about uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. It was, it's quite the transition here. And I'm actually wondering if the destruction of the temple in 70 AD might not even be a pattern for what might happen to the millennial temple in the tribulation period. But we'll leave that for a, another day. The, the real point is, is these same things to be watching for in Matthew 24 were called uh, birth pangs. Um, and here, here Jesus is giving even more uh, inclusive set of the same signs. Now he's including fearful sights and great signs uh, from heaven in this list. And so, you know, this idea of birth pangs where they start infrequent and light and far apart and they grow stronger and stronger and stronger. You definitely see that in the tribulation period. The question is, is to Jesus when were these things going to happen and uh, you know it's unclear you would say whether the birth pangs begin before the tribulation period or at the tribulation period <clears throat> but I'll, I'll argue that uh, it, it probably starts before the tribulation period one is we're, we're definitely seeing them <laughs> so that I guess is the most clear thing uh, the other is you know, birth pangs, they they build and they build and they build. And then, uh, you know, the other thing that's about birth pangs is, is uh, you know, once they start in earnest, they're not going to stop until you give birth. And it's reinforced and picked up actually over here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5 is a completely different context. It's specifically two believers in Thessalonica and the passages, um, this includes the passages where Paul is defining the rapture of the church. So let's just read a few verses here. But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child. There is your birth pangs again and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day, not of the night. Uh, so, you know, we could keep reading down there, but um, since this is, uh, the contrast here is the birth pangs 
come suddenly onto them, meaning, you know, the non-believers, because they're not the children of light. And for the children of light, it doesn't come on them as a surprise. And if, if that whole debate about the them versus us in this passage, with the us being the church and the dialogue about the rapture of the church, and, they're, and Paul's using the same thing about the birth pangs being uh, the statement about peace and safety and then the birth pangs come upon them as travail upon a woman that they won't escape. I think what we're saying is if you're in the light, you're going to see the attempts at peace and safety and you're going to see the birth pangs and that's your indication, people of the light, that, you know, um, your rapture and your redemption is at hand. And the people here that are not in the light, the destruction is going to come upon them suddenly. And uh, the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And, and this will all catch them by surprise. And if you just did a little cultural sampling right now, you definitely see that, you know, the people that are watching prophecy, they're looking for the return of the Lord, get excited by, you know, the signs in the heavens and the earthquakes and the pestilence and and the, all the dialogues about peace in the Middle East and all this. And, uh, you know, we sense it and, you know, we are the children of light. And yet you got most of society that think, anybody that's looking at this stuff is completely wacky crazy and you know a lot of them even in the church have no expectation of the second coming of Christ matter of fact the amillennialists you know well let me set aside most of them in the church don't have any expectation of the nearness of the coming of Christ and so um it's, I think this is why you can say it's legitimate to be talking about the earthquakes, the pestilence, the famines, the signs in the heavens and all that as being indicators of the nearness of the rapture is because of these verses, the reference to the birth pangs in the, in the rapture teaching from Paul and also when you look at Luke and Matthew, when they use these earthquakes and pestilence and famine, calling them the birth pangs, I think these things then tie together. So I wanted to make sure we hit that before we closed so that you knew that in Matthew 24, when, when it's talking about those things, and I said, well, they line up with the, uh, the tribulation period because Matthew wasn't seeing the church. I think the the subtle reference to birth pangs, though, was an indication that, you know, here now when we do have dialogue about the church and we're talking about the birth pangs again, we know what we can look for to be in the light, to know that the rapture is near. So that's how I tie those things together. Well, thanks for watching the video, and I guess I appreciate comments below, and I know some of this was a little more controversial, so... I just hope that uh, everybody is kind if you leave me a feedback where you disagree. Thank you.